Fatality, my diamonds that cold. Versace chunks, I hit my backstroke. Knock on the door. She at the back, bro. Welcome back to Houdini is Hip. In the previous part, we looked at how we can create a carbonated water effect using flip fluids inside of Houdini. In the last part, we mostly looked at the sort of swirling effect and the motion of our particles. We looked at density and how we can get our foam layer to separate from our water layer. And now, in this part, we want to actually start working towards a very particular effect. So what is the effect that we want to work towards? Well, the best thing to do when you're working towards a real life effect is to look at real life reference, right? That is the easiest way to really gauge what you should be focusing on. So I went ahead and recorded some footage for us. Over here, I just have a glass and I'm pouring in some sparkling water. Um, I know this is actually a mug, but it was like the clearest glass that I had that didn't have any sort of faceting or anything. So it's easiest to see what's going on inside of the fluid. So we play this back and let's see what we have, right? So we can start pouring from like three seconds and over here, this is what we have as our reference. Okay, so what are we really focusing on when we look at this? Well, we're looking at, firstly, when we're looking at flip fluids, how long is it going to take for this glass to fill up, right? That's gonna give us a good idea of what a correct fluid level looks like because our particle separation and things are going to affect how quickly this fills up in our actual simulation. So we need to actually use our reference to gauge how much this fills up. So we can see that from about three seconds, we start pouring. So three seconds, it first hits the glass. And then that goes on until about seven seconds. And that gives us, you know, three quarters of a glass. So that means that in four seconds, that's the fluid level that we reach, right? So we want to mimic that with our simulation. This is the sort of fluid level that we want to mimic and will also take about four seconds to reach it. The other thing that we should focus on is what's actually happening in the fluid, right? As you can see, as it's coming in, it's just this clear stream, but much like what we have in our simulation at the moment, this area of high vorticity starts generating this foaminess. You start generating that sort of foamy white area. And we're going to be doing that with a volume, but using our foam group, right? So as you can see, as this plays back, that white foam sort of dissipates. And we're left with these bigger bubbles towards the top of the fluid. Inside of the fluid, we still have a lot of these small swirling bubbles. So we're going to have to replicate that as well. And as you can see that as we move towards about seven seconds, it starts clearing up right? Until this point, the fluid is very much filled with bubbles and foam. So only from there does it start clearing up. And then towards the end, you only have this thin layer of bubbles at the top. All of those things are going to be replicated by us. The only thing that we're not really going to focus on too much are these secondary elements, like these streams of particles, because that's very much a secondary thing. And I don't want to take away too much from the fundamental understandings of this video. However, I will be giving you some ideas on how you can achieve that sort of thing. But for now, let's focus on the main elements. So inside of Houdini, we have this file over here. It's just called part two underscore start. You can use this file to continue from where we left off last. If you happen to have lost your file, or if you just wanna be in the exact same situation that I'm in over here with my setup as is. We can just save this as part three working, and now we can go through it. Okay. So the first thing that I want to focus on is actually this collider. If we look at our collider, it's quite thick, right? Now, when we come to rendering, that's going to be a bit of an issue because we don't want such a thick glass. So what we can actually do is over here, we can make separate colliders for visualization, for rendering, and for actual solving, right? So let's see what we have. And over here, you can see that if we make adjustments to our poly extrude thickness, the outside changes but the inside remains the same. And that's exactly what we want because we don't really want to be changing the inside because that's where everything's going to be colliding. So we're gonna do something over here. We're going to click and drag over all of these. So we're selecting everything from the poly extrude down to the glass out node. And then we're gonna right click and we're gonna say actions, create reference copy. That's gonna create the secondary chain over on the side, which actually exactly mimics every single setting on the left side. You can actually see this if I make a change to something on the left, the same change happens on the right over here. The cool thing is we can actually just go over to this poly extrude on the right. We can delete this over here. So delete channel for the distance. And now those two settings are no longer linked, right? So on the one on the left, this one is going to be for our collider. So let's make it quite thick, right? So we can do 0.15, right? That's pretty thick over there. And we end up with this strange looking collider over here. But that's good because we want our colliders to have decent thickness to work with, right? 
So remember, the inside of these two are still going to be the same, but the outside is going to have changed. On this one, on the right-hand side, we can decrease this distance to something like 0 0.035. Right, so this one's very thin. And this one's going to be our glass render. Right, so over here we have our glass render, and this is our collider. So we can even change this to glass collider out, glass collider, glass render. Cool. So now that we've separated those two out, let's go to our fluid based dynamics and we're going to make a few more changes. Okay, so the next thing that we want to do is make some changes inside of our fluid simulation, right? So inside of here, I'm going to go ahead and actually change our viscosity to a slightly higher value. We're going to do something like 0.06 or 0.075, right, for our foam. This is just going to allow us to have that more viscous look to our foam that collects at the top. Based on our reference, the top doesn't actually move much and it acts more like a single mass. So we want this higher viscosity so that we can get that sort of effect. The next thing that we want to do has to do with age and with life. Okay, so in Houdini, we have two attributes that are considered global attributes, right? We have at time and we have at frame. Now at frame, that's going to be obvious. That's literally what we have on our timeline, right? It's frame one, frame two, frame three, so on and so forth. Time, however, is going to look a little bit weird. It's going to look something like 0 0.04 and then 0 0.08 and so on and so forth, right? And it's also going to be increasing much like our frame rate. However, this time over here is calculated in an interesting way. So in Houdini, we have frames per second. And if you aren't familiar with video and how video is recorded, then frame rates might seem a bit odd to you. But a quick explanation, which is fairly intuitive, is that video is made up of individual frames or pictures, right? So if you're imagining a video, if you pause at any particular place in a video, right? So let's just have frame one, frame two, frame three, and frame four. If you pause anywhere in a video, it's just a still image. Right? So let's just say that a video is playing back and you pause over here. What you're going to see is this picture over here. Right? It's just a single image. Now, why does it seem like it's playing back smoothly? That's just because at 24 frames per second, or if we're playing 24 images in a second, that appears smooth. Right? 24 FPS is sort of the baseline for what our eyes perceive as smooth playback. And by default, Houdini uses 24 frames per second. So in your timeline, when you look at your timeline at the bottom over there, where you have all of your frames, one to 240, this is the same as zero to 10 seconds, right? So this is going to be your frames, one to 240, but in time, it's going to be zero to 10. Why is that? Because we're working in 24 frames per second, so you can take your frame number and divide it by the frames per second and actually get this actual time value, this at time over here, right? So why am I explaining this? Firstly, this is going to be useful for things like slow motion. If you have one second of footage and the second of footage is recorded at 24 FPS, then you have 24 frames, right? Because you have one second and in that one second, there's 24 frames. Now, if you try and slow down this 24 frame per second video, it's going to start looking jittery right? Because you only have 24 frames to work with. But if your one second of footage had 240 frames, so it was recorded in 240 FPS, then you could actually slow this down, right? You could slow this down by 10 times and play it back at 24 frames per second. So maybe this is confusing, but you have one second of footage. And in that one second of footage, you could have 24 frames, or you could have 240 frames, right? And then the rate at which you play it back defines how much footage you output, right? So this can be played back as one second of footage, but this, if played at 24 frames per second, comes out to 10 seconds of footage. That's how you end up with slow motion. You're taking a single second of animation or a single second of video, and you're spreading it out over 10 seconds, right? That's what you're doing in this situation over here. So in Houdini, we can do that. We can change our frame rate from 24 to some other amount. We end up with more simulation data, but then that also allows us to do things like slow motion. So that's something to keep in mind. But what's going to be important for us in this part is actually the at age attribute. At age is an attribute that exists on particles within a simulation. And all it does is it tracks the moment of the particle's birth and starts increasing from there, right? So if a particle is born on say frame 50, then its age is gonna be zero at frame 50, and it's going to increase from frame 50 onwards, 
So a particle is birthed, its age is zero, and then age increases over time. How is this calculated? Well, it's just the number of frames that have passed divided by the frames per second, right? So to calculate age, all you have to do is say age equals the number of frames that have passed since it was born divided by the FPS. So if a particle has been around for, let's say, 48 frames, and your frame rate is 24 frames per second, then your age is going to equal two, right? Age equals two or two seconds. However, if you're working with say a frame rate of 240 FPS, then it would be something like 48 frames over 240, and that's only equal to 0 0.2, so 0 0.2 seconds. Now this is important because particles age over time and their age is recorded in seconds. Right, so we need to know how old a particle is so that we can do particular things with it. For example, if we want our particles to be dying out, so those bubbles, if we don't want them to live past, say, four seconds, then we need to be tracking the age and using it to kill off particles. So all we're going to have to do is something like, if age is greater than four, then kill those particles, right? Something like that. And so this is the kind of logic that we're going to be using shortly. But the other thing that I want you to take note of is in our timeline, how are we calculating how many seconds have passed, right? So in our timeline, 24 is going to be one second, 48 is going to be two seconds, 72, three, and so on and so forth. So let's go back into Houdini. We now have an understanding of time and frame rates and age, and we can now use that inside of our simulation. So we looked at age, but we didn't really look at life. What is life? Well, if we go over to the particle motion tab on our solver and then go over to behavior and down to reap particles, we can activate it over here. Reaping particles, if you hover over it, it says kill any particles whose age attribute is greater than its life attribute. So much like how we have the age attribute. So let's just play this back. If I go to our geometry spreadsheet, you can see over here that we actually have an age attribute, right? This age is what I was telling you about where as time goes on, our particles gain age, right? They get older. However, every particle also has a life. Now the life is 100, that means 100 seconds. If the age gets greater than the life, then the particle dies, right? It makes a lot of sense. You can just think of, if you've reached your maximum life, then it should die, right? That's how the particles work. Now, none of these particles are going to reach 100 because that's 2,400 frames, right? 100 times 24. So we want our foam particles to have a lower life expectancy because our foam particles need to die over time, right? That's how we get that nice sort of initial particles and a lot of swirling going on, but then they die out very quickly. Only a few of them survive for long enough to stay at the top of our fluid. So how are we going to do that? This is where we're going to start looking at either a bit of code or we're going to be using VARPs. Now, I just want to show you what an attribute of VOP is versus an attribute wrangle. So we're going to have an attribute VOP over here and an attribute wrangle, AW, right? So as we know, an attribute wrangle, we can do a bunch of things. And I'm just going to do a very quick example over here. Let's just say we have a sphere and we plug it into an attribute wrangle. And in this attribute wrangle, we say V at CD equals, and then we give it some value, one comma zero comma zero. That's going to make our sphere red because we're saying make the CD attribute equal to one on R, zero on G, zero on B. One red, zero green, zero blue, right? That's gonna make it red. The alternative, if we had to use an attribute VOP, would be something like this, where we take a constant, set it to a color, make it red, so one, zero, zero, and plug that into CD. Both of these yield the same result. The difference is this one doesn't require any knowledge of coding, this one does. I've been using attribute wrangles because honestly, I prefer using VEX, but I do have to acknowledge that for most of you who aren't coming from coding backgrounds, this might be more intuitive. So in this part, we're going to be using an attribute VOP instead of an attribute wrangle. Neither of these are majorly different from the other. The only difference is that this is visual coding, this is just regular coding. So inside of our flip fluid solver, we're going to use a pop vop. So we take a pop vop and we're going to plug it in right over here after our pop speed limit. First thing we're going to do is activate the group and the group that we want to affect is our foam group. Right inside of here, we're going to be working on that life attribute for our foam so that our particles die over time. Inside of here, this is what you're going to end up with. I'm going to press control B to bring this up and maximize it. And you can also press P to hide or show parameters, right? So in the top right, you'll still have access to your parameters. 
Now, what do we want to do? We want to find a random value for each and every particle, right? Because every particle needs to have a random life because that's really the easiest way. We generate a random number for each and every particle and we use that to drive its life expectancy. So to do that, we're going to use a random node. A random node requires a particular seed, right? So the seed that you feed it needs to be unique per point. And the value that's unique per point is your ID. So we're gonna grab ID and we're gonna get a random value between zero and one. This just gives you a random value between zero and one. The next thing that we're gonna use is a ramp parameter. So over here, this ramp parameter, by default, is going to be an RGB color ramp. We want it as a spline ramp because we just want this over here. Now, how this ramp works is you feed it an input and the input needs to range from zero to one. And what that value that's being input is used as is the position on the horizontal axis of this ramp. Then, depending on the position horizontally on this ramp, it fetches the value vertically. That just means that if the input value is zero, by default, it will return a value of zero. If the input value is one, it will return a value of one. But if you were to say flip this around, then an input value of zero will actually return a value of one and an input value of one will return a value of zero. But you can make all sorts of changes to this curve, right? All sorts of changes to this ramp. So that now a value of zero or one returns a value of zero, but a value of 0 0.5 returns a value of one. 0 0.5 along this horizontal axis over here returns a value of one, right? You just track along to 0 0.5 over there, so halfway, and then you look at what value it's gonna return. So we plug our random value that we're generating for each point into this ramp. We can rename this ramp to distribution. And then this is gonna return a value between zero and one, right? The maximum value in this ramp is one. And so we don't want a maximum life of one. We want a maximum life of let's say seven, right? So we're gonna use a multiply constant over here. And all we're gonna do is we're going to multiply whatever's being output by this ramp by seven, right? That's going to mean that instead of going from zero to one, it's going to be from zero to seven. Then we want to export this life attribute. So we're gonna use a bind export node, bind export over here and output this over here. All you have to do is change the name of this parameter to life, right? So now it's exporting an attribute called life. Cool, so press control B to once again, minimize this and jump up a level. Over here, this is where you're actually going to be adjusting your ramp. Don't adjust your ramp at this level, always adjust your ramp at this level over here. So let's just make some adjustments. We want most particles to have a very low life expectancy. So we're going to drag a point over here. And then a few particles we want to live for quite long, right? So we're going to drag that over there. This is what our distribution is going to look like, right? Most points are going to live for, you know, maybe under a second. And then very few of them are going to live for close to seven seconds. So let's go up a level and play this back and see what we have. Okay, now before I even let this run, I'm just gonna look at our geometry spreadsheet over here. And let's just filter this by the group foam. And you can see over here that our age ranges between 0 0.2 and 0 0.9. But our life over here actually now ranges between zero and seven, right? So as you can see, most values are super, super low, right? Almost all of them are below, you know, two seconds but very few particles are gonna live for quite long, right? There's a few particles that are gonna live for seven seconds. That's exactly what we want, right? We want most particles to have a low age so that they're mostly there for that swirling effect that we end up with, and very few of them live for long. Okay, so to my eye, that looks pretty decent, actually. We have foam that mostly gathers towards the start and then fades away, right? It sort of disappears over time. So that looks decent. There's a few things that I wanna change. I would like more particles on this initial impact over here. So we can actually drop this value over here for the foam where we're saying greater than 150 in our vorticity. Let's decrease that. Let's just say if it's greater than 120, right? So that's gonna give us more foam. The other thing that we're now going to have to do is make some adjustments to the amount of fluid that ends up in this glass because we saw that we're only emitting from frame one to frame 48. And that is only a range of two seconds, right? How do I know that 48 frames is two seconds? If we go over here, this is our frame rate, FPS. And so this is frames per second, right? So after 24 frames, one second has passed. After 48 frames, two seconds has passed. 72 frames is three seconds, 96 is four seconds. So we want to emit over four seconds based on our reference. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move these keyframes up. If your simulation happens to play back when you're trying to do this, 
just click on this brain over here. This will disable simulation so that you can freely move in your timeline without there being any issues. What we're gonna do over here is on the sphere, middle mouse on the second keyframe, drag it over to frame 96, and the first frame will drag over to frame 90, right? So between frame 90 and 96, this will now taper down to zero. If you somehow didn't catch that with the middle mouse thing and it wasn't working for you, you can also very easily just say delete channels, right? So now it removes all the keyframes. Go over to frame 90, keyframe it as 0.04, .04. go over to 96, set this to zero, alt and click, that'll keyframe it there, right? Same thing. Okay, that's gonna give us a lot more fluid in our simulation which is fine, but it's going to look unrealistic. So we're gonna make some changes over here. I'm going to reset a lot of these settings. So we're gonna go back to a scale of two for our grid scale. Our particle radius scale, we're actually going to go 1.25. So we're going higher than the default, but that's because we're gonna decrease our particle separation because now we're gonna do the final quality simulation, right? So we're gonna halve this to 0 0.002. This is going to be quite a high resolution simulation now. And so I'm not gonna play it back over here anymore. I'm actually gonna go up a level, create a new geometry node and call this fluid meshing, right? We can just hide these two over here and inside of fluid meshing, we're gonna use a dop IO, so dop IO. With this dop IO, we're gonna go over here to the dop network, just go to choose your flip fluid solver. Then to the dop node, we're gonna choose the dop object, so the flip object. And then the preset that we're gonna use is just flip fluid. That's gonna bring in this fluid over here. The next thing that I want us to do is to just use a compress node, a fluid compress. So we use a fluid compress node over here. Now the fluid compress is gonna do a couple of things for us. You're gonna see that it looks a bit weird, but basically what it's doing is it's compressing our fluid down to a smaller file size. The first thing that we need to take note of is that our particle separation over here is not matching our simulation. So we have to go up a level, fluid-based dynamics, dive inside over here from the flip object, go to your particle separation and just say, copy parameter, right? So we're gonna copy parameter over here. Go back up and into fluid meshing, we're just gonna right click on the particle separation and paste relative references. That's just going to fetch it from our simulations so that they're always matching, right? That's the first thing we wanna do. So this is packing our particles and it's deleting any sort of unnecessary attributes that we may have. The one attribute that it does delete that we actually wanna be keeping is life. So over here, just add that life attribute over there and that'll make sure that it doesn't delete that life attribute. The other thing is actually this cull bandwidth. And this cull bandwidth thing is really useful for if you're working with ocean simulations, but not so useful when you're working with small scale simulations. And I'll show you why shortly. So this is gonna take a little while, but I'm just gonna play it back. And you can see that this is quite a high resolution simulation now. So over here, the issue that I want you to take note of can only be seen if we use a particle fluid surface, right? So we go over here and we plug our fluid compress into our particle fluid surface. Change this to particles. And what you'll see is over there, it appears as if there's no particles on the inside. And that's because that's exactly what's happening. This fluid compress actually only cares about the surface particles, right? The ones that make up the outside of the fluid. But you can see that when we bring this in directly from our solver, it's got loads of particles inside. And we need those particles because those are what are going to be turned into bubbles. And it's gonna be most of the detail coming from our simulation. So we don't actually want to be removing those inside particles. It's doing that to save space because if we were working with a ocean simulation, you don't really care about what's beneath the surface. You only care about the surface of the ocean, right? So that's where something like that comes in handy. To disable that, we just disable this cull bandwidth, right? So disable cull bandwidth and there you go, right? You just have that over there. Now you can very easily save this to disk. So all we're gonna do is just set an explicit file path. And over here, we can just change the name to fluid sim out dot dollar f dot bge o dot se. Fluid sim out dot dollar f dot bge o dot se. And then we can go ahead and save that to disk. Cool. So once that's done, we can just plug the file cache into our particle fluid surface and play it back directly from disk. So I'm gonna go ahead and just copy my little color nodes that I have over here. So control C, control V and once again, color our particles so we can see our foam level. Okay, so initially loads and loads of foam. And as this plays back, the foam sort of starts to die out and we end up with just a thin layer at the top and some bubbles in the middle. And that is very close to what we're looking for, right? Loads of particles there. And then they slowly taper off and we end up with much fewer particles. 
Now, I just want you to take note of the particle count that we have, right? That's about 200,000. This might seem like a lot, but when it comes to things like ocean simulations, you'll often end up with particle counts of 50 million upwards. So this is a super light simulation, right? This took my computer, I think, three minutes or so. So you can actually push this up. You can push up the resolution of this. You can go even higher with it if you are looking for a higher resolution simulation. So that's perfectly fine. I'm also happy with the fluid level. That's important. We can compare it to our glass over here. Let's just go to our glass render, right? So that's the one that we want. And I'm just going to press W for the wireframe mode. And there you can kind of see, right? So that looks kind of cool to me. That looks like a good fluid level. So I did realize that I did just make one mistake over here. If we take a look at the fluid, it's kind of sitting away from the bottom of the glass. And that's just because due to these match sizes now working on two different size glasses, you're going to end up with one sitting higher than the other. We can just disable these over here. So just bypass both of them. And now both of them sit at the same level. And we can simulate with that, right? So you can just rerun your simulation. It shouldn't take too long right over here. And then once again, I'll be back in four minutes and we'll continue on. Okay. So now after all of that, we should have a decent looking simulation. Okay, so now that we have our simulation locked in, let's just do a quick summary because we're not really going to be revisiting our actual simulation from here. So I just wanna go back to our simulation and I wanna go through a couple of things as a reminder. You can skip this part, this is going to be timestamped. I just wanna go over all of the things that we've done just so that it's easy for you to remember this sort of setup, right? So we have our emitter. We turn it into a flip source over here. The voxel size and particle separation are going to be matching, and they're also going to match what's inside of the flip solver. All we're doing over here is initializing a viscosity and a density, because we're going to be using that viscosity and density inside of our simulation. Then inside of our simulation over here, we created a flip object, a flip solver, and a volume source. The volume source is obviously going to be sourcing in, and we can just use the initialization type of source flip, right? And then, of course, we just bring in our source. With this flip solver, we changed a bunch of things. Firstly, we increased our substeps to three because we have a fast moving fluid. Sometimes if you have a slow moving fluid, you won't need to increase the substeps over here. But because we have particles that are collapsing in on each other, we need more substeps so that they can resolve correctly. Under the particle motion tab, we added an ID attribute, we aged our particles, and we reaped particles. The ID attribute, I want you to remember that. We didn't really focus on it in the previous part, but in this part, we're going to be going over exactly why we needed that. We age our particles so that over time, they have an age attribute that increases, and then we reap them. So if their age is greater than their life, we kill those particles. We have a separation over here. So applying particle separation tries to enforce this flip object particle separation that we have over here so that particles don't collapse in on each other, right? So this is useful for maintaining even spacing of our particles. Under vorticity, we just have this over here. This represents the swirling in your velocity field. This is useful for generating things like turbidity. For example, if you're doing a river simulation, this might be an area of high turbidity. So that area will appear more opaque, right? Or more muddied. If we go over to the volume motion tab, we have our volume limits. We just change the size because we're working at a smaller scale. So it just needs to kind of encompass the entire size of our simulation. You can see what our limits look like over here. So nothing outside of that gets simulated. Oh, and one other thing, we switch this to APIC swirly. And this is just dependent on the kind of look that you're going for. You can do splashy. And if you're doing splashy, then you have velocity smoothing. This just blurs velocity so that particles share velocity, right? So APIC swirly kind of encourages this, but splashy has a slider for controlling the exact amount that you want that to happen. Over under the viscosity tab, we've enabled viscosity and we've done viscosity by attribute. We've also done slip on collision. Slip on collision is so that it doesn't stick to our collider and the fluid slips back into the rest of the fluid. This over here also works in conjunction with the flip object settings over here. Under the initial data, you have to add a viscosity attribute, right? So it's three settings, add viscosity, enable viscosity and viscosity by attribute. Over here, we have our density. We just have to enable it, density by attributes. Over on the solver side, we didn't actually enable it, but you can use OpenCL. If you enable OpenCL, then all of the Eulerian calculations, so the calculations that are done on the grid or on our fields, those are going to be done using our GPU, so it's gonna speed it up significantly, right? So those are just the few things that we changed on our flip solver. Over on the flip object, right, we were messing around with particle radius scale and grid scale. These are going to change depending on your simulation, right? It even changes depending on the particle separation. 
When I decreased our particle separation for our final resolution simulation, I increased our particle radius scale because I didn't want our fluid to lose too much volume, but I brought the grid scale back up to two because I didn't find that our particles were being under-resolved or that we were losing volume. So these two over here generally will be okay at their default, but I did want to explain to you what these do just in case you do want to change them. Okay, then we did this based on our vorticity attribute. This is that swirling that we're talking about, right? That attribute, vorticity, if it's greater than a certain amount, add our particles into a foam group. In the proper angle, that foam group gets a lowered density so that those particles rise to the top. And this is how you'll almost always do foam. You'll use density. Over here, we have viscosity so that our foam sticks to our glass and it moves together as a single mass. Over here, under pop drag, we just added a little bit of drag so that our particles aren't just moving too freely, there's a bit of resistance to their movement. Under the pop speed limit, we just added a maximum speed of four, just to ensure that our particles aren't splashing all over the place and getting out of control. And then finally, over here, we have our two static objects. The one is set to use surface collisions, and this one just brings in our regular geometry for our surface. This one over here does the same thing, except it is set to volume collisions with a mode of volume sample. And down here, this is the volume that we're using for those collisions, right? So we're actually using two of them because this volume collisions deals really well with movement along the volume or across the volume surface. But this over here deals really well with preventing particles from going through the surface. So we combine them so we get the best of both. Okay, that's really all there is. Right, so I hope that you understand the solving side of this because we're gonna be moving on from that and we're pretty much done with that. We're now moving on to the meshing over here. So we have our simulation, right? And it's looking decent. We have a good looking simulation over here, but now we want to start working on bubbles. The best way that we can possibly do bubbles is by using this foam group and actually creating bubbles from it. So let's first blast away everything that's not part of that group. Over here, we can just plug our color in and we don't even have to use the color. We can go straight from the particle fluid surface over here. I'm also going to press Shift and S to make these squared off connectors. And on this blast node, I'm going to select foam and I'm going to delete non-selected so that we just have our foam group, right? So that's all that we have over there. Now we can work with this very specifically. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove some of these particles because there's just too many, right? I think we have too many particles and we don't need this many. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete a random amount of them. There's a bunch of ways that you can do this. The easiest way is going to just be with a delete node, but I don't want to just be deleting random points necessarily. I want to be deleting random points based on IDs. What do I mean by this? This is going to be an incredibly important concept for your Houdini journey, right? I want you to really focus on what I'm going to be showing you here because this confuses a lot of people. When we look at ID attributes, right? Why do we have this attribute in our geometry spreadsheet called ID, right? Why is it there? What's the point of it? So ID is unique per point. A single point in our simulation maintains its ID throughout the simulation. If at frame one, you emit a point and it has an ID of 56, for the entire duration of that simulation, that point's ID is going to be 56, right? Until the moment that it dies. So it's constant. However, its point number is going to be changing throughout the simulation. So at frame one, it might be point number 70, but at frame 50, it might be point 300, right? So point numbers change, but IDs stay the same. And this is important. I'm gonna show you over here on the side why this is so important. So I'm just gonna create a sphere over here, right? Just a sphere. Then we're gonna use a scatter node. So scatter over there, and then a copy to points, copy to points, right? And I'm just gonna copy all of these spheres to these points. So those are going to be too big. So on the scatter over here, what I'm gonna do with an attribute wrangle is just say at p scale equals 0.1, right? So we have that. Each and every point is scaled down to 0.1 times its uniform scale. Now, the other thing that I want to do is actually add an ID attribute. So I'm gonna say at ID equals at pt num. Now, what is pt num? PT num is the point number, right? If we go over to our geometry spreadsheet, you'll see that this has worked because each and every point number corresponds to the ID that I've just created, right? So each point has an ID that corresponds to its point number. Now, at this point, you won't see the relevance of it because each and every point has a matching ID to it. But when we start removing points, our point numbers are gonna change, but our IDs are gonna stay the same. So let me show you that. So let's just say in a new attribute wrangle over here, right? So a second one over here, I'm just gonna say at p scale 
times equals, and this one I'm gonna say rand at pt num, right? So if you're not familiar with this, all that we're saying is take our p scale and multiply it by some random value based on at pt num, right? So this rand function over here takes pt num and generates a random value based on it, right? We don't really care about what random value is being generated, just that there is a random value and this is the seed that's being used to generate it, right? So if you change this value over here, you'll get different random values. Okay, so everything looks good, right? However, if we now use a delete node, so I'm just gonna use a delete node before our attribute wrangle over here. And I'm just going to delete points like this. I'm gonna go over to random and enable. As I change the percentage of points that are being deleted, you'll see that they kind of jitter, right? So like that point over there, if I change the number of points, then its size changes. And that's because as we're deleting points, our point numbers are changing, right? So you can see we now have 532 points, but if I change it, we now have 800 points. And I can actually show you this. If we switch on our point numbers, right? Each and every point has a point number. But the second that I change the number of points in here, you can see that the numbers change, right? You can see that that one over there is 263, but if I delete some more points, it changes to like 249. And that's no good because if we're changing the point number, then this is gonna generate a random value that's different every time this point number changes. So how do we make sure that it's consistent, right? How do we make sure that this jittering doesn't happen when we delete points, right? So when we're deleting points like this, how do we make sure that each point is staying consistent? That's where ID comes in. So we can actually generate this based on ID. ID is consistent, right? ID is staying the same throughout our simulation or throughout this example that I'm doing over here. So now when I delete points, there's none of that jittering, right? That's extremely important because we're using ID instead of point number. Now, how does this relate to our simulation? Well, when we're simulating, points are constantly being added into the simulation, as you can see initially, right? All of those points are being added. So our point numbers are going to be consistently changing, but our IDs are going to stay the same. So we can do all sorts of calculations using our IDs rather than using our point numbers. This is also important if you're doing something like a point deform, right? A point deform, if the number of points that you have is changing, then it's going to distort your geometry, right? There's a whole bunch of situations in Houdini where you need to be careful with your point count changing, right? And ID is one way to work around that. Okay, so that was a bit of a lengthy explanation, but I do believe that it's important for your understanding. So I think it was worth it. Let's go ahead and now create an attribute VARP. You can do this with an attribute wrangle. Um, I initially did it with an attribute wrangle, but I think this is going to be more intuitive for a lot of you. Okay, for this, I'm gonna press D. I'm gonna go over to geometry and set this to lit spheres. As you can see, it's just gonna make these spheres over here. And that represents their p-scale, right? So if we take a look at their p-scale, this 0.0025, that's what that's representing, right? It's making a geometry representation of what this point scale is expected to look like. So now we can go inside of here and we're going to make some changes to our p-scale. Let's firstly work on scaling our particles down depending on their height. How can we do that, right? How can we find the maximum height and the minimum height and then just scale particles down depending on how high up they are? This is where we're going to use something called a bounding box. And if you take a look using the bound node, a bound is just this, right? It's just the smallest possible box that can cover whatever you're using as an input, right? So as you can see, as we move along, the bounding box increases in size because the fluid level is increasing, right? We're going to use something like that. And what we're going to use inside of here is the relative bounding box. So you can see a relative to bounding box, this over here. And it requires a few things. First is the input. Now over here, we have up input one. We're gonna plug that into file. Alternatively on file, you can also just say first input. All that's saying is use the first input that's coming into our attribute VARP as the thing to work on. Next, we're gonna take our position over here. So it's gonna spit out a bounding box, but the bounding box is really useful. The relative bounding box actually gives us the minimum on each axis as zero and the maximum on each axis as one. What does that mean? It means that the bottom of this is going to have a value of zero on the y-axis and a value of one on the y-axis at the topmost point. So we can use a vector to float. This is going to split that up. So it splits it up into three. So now we have X, Y, and Z and we can use the Y component to drive our p-scale. So we're gonna use a ramp parameter. We've used this already. Into this ramp, we're gonna take this. And over here, we can just rename this ramp to Y underscore scalar. 
And just make sure that you actually have the second input. We want the y component of this vector, right? That over there, that's gonna be for our height. Okay, we also want this to be a spline ramp, just like that. And now we can also use a parameter node over here. And this we can call uniform underscore scale, something like that. And what we're going to do is we're just going to multiply these two together. We're gonna to multiply our uniform scale by our y scalar, and then bind export that as our p scale, p scale, right? It won't do anything as is because we have to go up a level and initialize these values. So go down here, our uniform scale, we can do 0 0.002, something like that. And then our y scalar, we can just increase over here. So now you can see that the particles at the bottom are smallest, right? So you can make adjustments to this and it's a really, really useful technique to use, right? Getting the bounding box over here using this relative bounding box taking the y component of it, and then putting that into a ramp so that we can control exactly the fall off of a particular value, right? So if we had to play that back, what's nice is that only the particles at the top are really what's going to be focused on. And so we of course do want some low values at the bottom there. And so we can just play around with this ramp until we're kind of happy with what we have, right? I think something like that. So most particles inside of the fluid are fairly small, but the ones at the top of the fluid our biggest. But that's not all that we want to do. We want to make some more changes to this. We also want to adjust each particle scale by the life attribute that we have. So over here, we can also pull in this life attribute. Let's use this as well. But remember, life is going to range between zero and seven. So we need to fit that range. So we use a fit range to fit it instead from zero to seven to zero to one, all right? So the source min and the source max is from zero to seven and the new minimum and maximum is from zero to one. This just compresses all of those values into a smaller range so that we can use it in a ramp. Once again, we can make a new ramp, so ramp parameter. This one over here is just going to be our life underscore scalar. And again, it's going to be a spline ramp. Plug this into your spline ramp over here. And then we can also multiply this by that ramp over there. So we're doing two multiplications now one by our y scalar and one by our life scalar. Go up a level and adjust this life scalar over here. As you can see, the particles that live longer, they are going to be bigger, right? Okay, so we actually have everything in place over here to work with this the way that we need to, right? So we have a way of controlling the scale of particles based on their life attribute. We have a way of working with particles based on their height from the bottom. Now we want to duplicate this over and we only want to work on certain particles, right? So we actually want to create two streams. We want to have one that's going to be sort of hero particles, right? They're going to be the big particles that sit on the top. Those are going to be actual geometry. Then we're going to have secondary particles, these smaller ones over here that we're just going to treat as particles, right? We're going to render them as particles. So let's just think about what we want, right? The particles that we're going to render as secondary particles, we just want the small ones inside over here. So we're going to make two changes over here. For our secondary particles, we actually want them to be biggest when they're at the bottom and get smaller as they come to the top. So we can just flip this around just like that. Decrease this y scalar value over here. And we can just have that over there, right? Something like that. These particles are also too big. So over here under the uniform scale, we can just halve this to 0 0.001 and that looks decent. So something else that would be nice is a way to kind of cull these extremely small particles off, right? We don't want really, really tiny particles because they're just going to mess up our render. They're going to add unnecessary artifacts to our render and just make it difficult to work with. So inside of our scalar, let's also add one more thing for removing points. What we're going to do is use a compare, right? A compare is like an if statement. So before where we had if and else statements, and then we have if this is true, then do this, else do that. This is the same thing, right? What we're going to do is we're going to take that p scale value that we have over here. We're going to say if our p scale is less than, and then we want some parameter to control this with. So we can once again use a parameter. We can call this threshold, right? Just like that. Let's plug that into the second input. And this is going to return a true or false. What are we going to use with that true or false? We're going to use a switch. So it's going to be a two way switch, right? And we plug this in over here. Now it can switch between true or false, right? How this works is if a particle is smaller than this threshold amount, then it will return true, right? If it's true, it'll use the first input. If it's false, it'll use the second input. So what we're gonna do is use a remove point, right? So remove point over here, and then the result is going to be the point to remove. Okay, so what we want to do over here is we wanna say, 
if a particle is smaller than the threshold amount, then remove, and we're going to grab point number over here, pt num. Going to grab that over there, plug that in as first input. So if it is less than the threshold, remove that point. Otherwise, remove point minus one. So our second input, we're going to set as minus one. This just means don't remove the point, right? Okay, so let's just see if that works. If we go up a level, we can increase our threshold over here. So we're going to have to use some very, very small amount over here. All right, so there you can see we're starting to remove the very small points. All right, so now we just have a threshold for removing points. If a point gets too small, it just gets removed. Okay, that's really cool, right? Now we can take this and we can use it for those bigger particles. We want the particles on top as well. So we can just duplicate this over onto this side and we're gonna make a few changes. So over on the side, these are gonna be our hero particles. So we can make these bigger, maybe 0 0.004, right? So they're quite big. And then we're gonna flip the Y scalar, right? We want them to be biggest when they're at the top, like that. So you can see that we end up with something like that. And now we only want the particles with a very long life to be big. So we're gonna drag this over here to something like that. And now we can increase this threshold amount to a higher value, right? Because we only want very few particles. So we can do something perhaps even higher like that. And we can just make some changes to things like our Y scalar, decrease the threshold a bit like that. Now, the last thing that we wanna do is just delete some random points, right? We just want to delete a random number of points from this just so that we don't have such a high number of points, right? We want to be able to control exactly how many points we have. So we're going to use a delete node over here. We're going to set this to points. We're going to go over to random. We're going to enable it, but we are going to use this ID as a seed attribute. That way, the deleting doesn't jitter around like we saw before. And now we can delete an exact percentage of points, right? So if we want to delete 100%, we can but we can now very finely control how many points are being removed, right? So I hope you're seeing how that's useful. We now just have a few big points at the top. And of course, you can make all sorts of changes. You can push this up a bit to have bigger particles and then remove more of them. You can have a better range on your life scaling. And in fact, we even had particles being biggest at around five seconds. So we can actually do something like this. And I think that that looks pretty good. There we go. So I'm just going to merge these two together so that we can see them. And I'm also going to use the same delete node over on this side so I can delete a percentage of these. So that looks decent, but we can delete fewer, something like that. Okay, and then let's merge these two together and see what our bubbles look like. Cool, so these ones over here, again, too big. You can just make changes to these as you see fit. Okay, that looks good to me. So now let's just delete this merge node and we're gonna have two streams over here. This one on the left, this is going to be our secondary particles out. So secondary particles, right? And we can actually just add an out to this because this is the output for it. And we can just move that over to the side. That's looking good. I'm happy with how these particles are looking. So let's focus on the other side. On the other side, we actually wanna make these work a bit differently, right? Over on the side, we actually want this to not just be you know, spheres, we wanted to actually affect the surface of our fluid because these are bigger particles, so they should actually affect our surface. So this over here, where we have our particle fluid surface, we're going to be working from here. So just go over here, press D. We can once again switch this back to points. And over here from our file cache, we're going to once again add a new particle fluid surface, particle fluid surface right over here, plug this into the first input, and now you're going to see an issue, right? Our particle separation over here is going to cause this to just look a bit strange. What we need is to once again from our fluid compress or from our particle simulation, go ahead and copy this parameter for our particle separation and plug it in over here. Paste relative references, just like that. Okay, so that's creating a fluid surface, but that's not exactly what we want. Go over to the surface polygon soup at the bottom and change this to a surface VDB. So now it's a volume. It's not actually a surface just yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to convert these points into bubbles. We're going to then convert them to a VDB, and then we're going to add them to this volume and then subtract little holes from this volume, right? So that might seem a bit confusing, but it's going to make our bubbles look a lot better. So what we're going to do here is just a remesh bubbles, and this is new in Houdini 20. So you won't be able to do this in anything prior to Houdini 20. So we're gonna use remesh bubbles over here. This goes into there, 
and we end up with these bubbles, right? If you look at this, you can see that these bubbles actually do appear smaller over here. So you can push this value up, uniform scale, up to 0.6, 0.7, even 0.8, right? So you have fairly big bubbles. And then with this remesh bubbles, we're going to convert them to a VDB. So we're going to use a VDB from polygons right over here. That's going to convert them to a VDB. Now you'll see that it has a voxel size over here. What's cool is that you can actually just copy the voxel size from this particle fluid surface by plugging it into the second input, right? You can see it says optional reference VDB. So it'll just match the resolution. Now we can reshape these. So we're going to use a VDB reshape SDF. And this is just going to dilate those bubbles very slightly, right? We can change the offset over here to choose exactly how much. I'm going to do 0 0.6 for now. Then we're going to use a VDB combine. VDB combine over here. Take your particle fluid surface and combine it with these bubbles, right? And you won't see anything just yet because you have to change the operation to an SDF union, right? That's just going to bring these two together. Now you can, of course, convert this to a mesh. So you're going to use a convert VDB just like this, convert from a volume to polygons. And it's going to give you this. You can see that where there's bubbles, it actually adds this little bump, right? So it is actually affecting the surface of our fluid now. We went from this where it's not to this where it is. But that's not all that we want. We're going to do one more thing over here, and that is to Boolean out the original bubbles. What this means is we're going to cut out these bubbles over here from this mesh that we've created. Right, so we're going to cut this out by putting this into the second input. And if we press W for wireframe, you can see that it's actually cutting them out of the inside of the fluid. Right. So this is quite cool because now our fluid actually has cutouts for where the bubbles are supposed to be, much like how water would actually have these bubbles existing inside of them. This is exactly what we have now. Right, so we've cut it out using this boolean. Over here, if you'd like to reduce the resolution, you can reduce it something like three. This will make it run a bit faster. So that when you Boolean, there's less intersections to cut, right? So it still works. Now, the last thing that we want to do for this is actually take our initial glass surface and cut away, right? So smooth this based on that. So we're going to use an object merge, and we're going to go ahead and grab our glass. And we can actually use our glass render for this. So you can see that we're bringing this in over here, and we're going to do one more Boolean. So we're going to Boolean this with our glass, right? So once again, we're subtracting our glass from this over here. You can see that all of the points where it contacts the glass, it's going to smooth out, right? So it's smoothing out all of those areas where there is contact with the glass. This just ensures that we don't have any intersection with the actual glass. And it's going to help our simulation to look a lot more realistic because we're not going to have any sort of weird refraction issues where these two collide, right? So that is going to be our fluid surface. So we can add a null over here. And we can just call this fluid surface out. Okay, a quick recap of what we've done over here. So we had our particle fluid surface as particles. We blasted everything but the foam. Using that, we made these particles over on the side, which all have a unique P scale, which we can visualize by pressing D and setting them to lit spheres, right? That's their scale. Over on the side, we created bubbles using the same setup. We remesh them so that these are our bigger bubbles. And then we made a particle fluid surface as a VDB. We then converted our bubbles to a VDB, increased their size slightly, and combined it with the fluid. We then converted that to a mesh. So this is now geometry, where we have polygons and primitives as opposed to a VDB. We then booleaned out those initial bubbles, right? By doing that, we end up with these holes in our volume, which act as bubbles. Then we went ahead and we took our glass over here and we cut that away from our mesh as well. So our fluid mesh over here, any part that would intersect with the glass no longer does. And then we have our fluid surface out. So we now have a fluid surface and we have bubbles over here. So these are small secondary bubbles. The only thing that we want now is to just create a volume. So we're going to create a volume from these particles over here. So for this last bit, we're just going to be creating some foam. And this is maybe going to get complicated. But it's an extremely useful technique that I'm about to show you, and it's one that's going to help you a lot when working with particles and volumes. Once again, going back to where we just have our foam over here, what we're going to do is we're going to use a rasterized particles. Volume rasterized particles, very similar to our volume rasterized points, but we're actually going to plug this in as the second input. 
those are the particles, to rasterize. Now you'll see that it gives us an issue. That's because it requires a base volume. So all we have to do is use a VDB node, just a plain old VDB node, plug that into the first input. Right, it's just going to make this mess over here. So we have to increase the resolution of our VDB by decreasing the voxel size, 0.01, even lower, 0.05, or 0.002, right? Something like that. You can see that that converts this to a volume. But that's not exactly what we want, right? So what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to decrease this particle scale, right? I want to decrease it until we're getting areas that are brightest towards the top, right? Something like that. And then I'm going to use a volume slice. Right, we're going to use a volume slice over here. And this volume slice is going to show you this over here. This is your visualization for what the values actually are inside of this volume. If I go over to the geometry spreadsheet, you can see that it actually ranges between 0 and about 100. So over here in the visualization range, change this to 100. And you'll see that what you're getting is actually a volume representation of which areas have the highest density of points. Right, And so we can make some changes to this. I'm going to increase the particle scale slightly until we have something like that. And then I'm going to go over to this voxel size over here and do 0.003. That's going to blur it out a bit, something like that. And this is exactly what we want, right? This is going to give us these areas of high point density, right? So as you can see, there's high densities all the way up there at the top. But this isn't exactly how we're going to use it. What we're going to do is we're going to take these foam particles and then in an attribute voc, once again, you can use an attribute wrangle as well. What we're going to do is we're going to take our initial particles over here into first input, and we're going to take this volume over here into second input, right? And what we want to do is we actually want to fetch the density from this volume rasterized particles and apply it to these particles, right? So we want to see where there's high particle densities. And so we're going to go into our attribute VOP over here, and we're going to use a volume sample node, volume sample, this over here. This is going to require a few things. Firstly, we're going to have to change what input we're using, right? As you can see over here, it has file, first input, second input. We want second input because our volume is coming into the second input. So that's the volume that we're going to be sampling. Then we're going to take the position of our points, and that's going to be where to sample. Then the value that we find at that position, we can export as something, right? And so I'm going to create a new attribute using a bind export node. And what we're going to bind export is just going to be this value. And we're going to call it foam underscore density. And if we go up a level and to our geometry spreadsheet, our particles now have something called foam density. And you can see that it ranges over here from about 72. So what is that exactly? Well, that's exactly what we just saw over here. If we now take a look over here and I use a color node, we can visualize it. So we're going to say ram from attribute foam underscore density. And we know it ranges to about 100, so 0 to 100. And that is exactly what we're looking for, right? These areas of high foam density are what we're looking for, right? That up there. So if we push up this low end, then that is the foam density that we really want, right? So that is what we want to now convert to a volume. That's the volume that we're going to use inside of our render so that we end up with that nice layer of white foam. And so to do that, what we're going to have to do is change the range over here. So we're going to use a fit range and we're going to fit the range instead of from zero to 100 to zero to one, right? So now if we go up a level, we can actually just use from zero to one because we've now fit that range and it'll do the same thing. And then we can also use a ramp parameter, ramp parameter right over here. And let's just change this name to something like threshold and then give this as a spline ramp. And the last thing that we're going to do is actually just change the name of this attribute to chist density, right? So it's just density. Okay, so that'll work, right? Each one of our particles is now getting an attribute called density, which ranges between zero and one. And we can control what the cutoff point is for that value by using this ramp over here on our threshold. So if we don't want low values, we can push this up and it'll only give us the high density areas, which is really nice. Right, so if we were to visualize this now, just one last visualizer, ramp from attribute, density. You can see that as we adjust this, we're singling out certain areas, right? So we can only get the super high density areas if we want, and that is going to be really useful. Last thing that we want to do, because we're going to be using the volume rasterize attributes, which we've used before, we know that it actually uses a particle scale. We're going to have to choose a p scale to use for this, so let's just use something over here. We'll make a parameter node. 
We'll just call this uniform scale and we'll bind export that as p scale. Bind export as p scale. Right, so we're taking our uniform scale, binding it out as p scale, and we're just going to set this to something like 0 0.1. Plug that into the volume rasterize attributes. The attribute that we want is density. And you can see that it's going to be this big blobby mess. So that tells us a few things. So decrease this uniform scale to something like 0 0.02, 0 0.01. Cool. And then decrease the voxel size to something like 0 0.001. Right? Pretty high resolution like that. And once again, decrease this uniform scale even more. Cool. So, so you can play around with this until it looks right to you. I'm going to maybe bring that voxel size up a bit more just so that it runs a bit faster. Okay. There we go. Now the really cool thing about this is that this ramp over here controls exactly the range that we're looking for, right? So that's going to be the volume that we render. You can see that we end up with that very similar ring to what we see when we have the actual reference material and we have loads and loads of control over where our volume is. Right, cool. And that we can once again use a null and just call this foam volume out. Perfect. That's everything, right? So we now have our foam, we have our secondary particles, and we have our fluid surface. And into our fluid surface, we have built in these bubbles, right? They are part of this. And if you find that your Boolean or anything is taking too long, you can make adjustments, right? You don't have to have so many bubbles. This is probably overkill. So, you know, on your scalar, you can increase the threshold a bit until it's only the big bubbles, right? Something like this. So play around with these settings until you think that this mimics the look that you would like. Right, and as you can see, you end up with these holes in the mesh where the bubbles are. We have our foam over here. We have our secondary particles over here. So I know that this part may have been quite confusing. We went through quite a bit, especially in terms of procedural workflows that we haven't really looked at before. We also looked at attribute vops in a whole new light. And this is also just to show you that you don't need to be able to code in Houdini, right? I just wanted to show you that this is an alternative to attribute wrangles if you find that this is more intuitive. Okay, so in the next part, all that's left for us to do is really to just render this out, right? We have our glass, we have our fluid mesh, we have all of our bubbles and foam and everything. So in the next part, we can just render this out. So I hope to see you in the next part. Thanks for watching. Bye.